We started off 2019 on a search mission. A game of entomology I spy in the winter forests of northern Connecticut. What we were looking for was tiny and practically invisible to our untrained eyes, yet it can kill mature trees and potentially wipe out droves of a particular species. So you can see the tree actually looks quite healthy. It's got a lot of new growth. That's Carol Chia. For over 20 years, she's been hard at work in the field and has a keen eye for what we're looking for. See, this is where the stick comes in handy. Yeah. So we're looking for little white specks. It's an I spy game. Yeah, it is. It's an I spy game. It's really hard. Oh. Here it is. See? No. See them? They're much smaller than what I showed you in the lab. Along the... Oh, yeah, yeah. OK, OK. So they're small. Back here. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. OK. What we found was hemlock woolly adelgid, an invasive insect native to East Asia, which afflicts North America's eastern hemlock and Carolina hemlock tree species. Both species are highly susceptible to the adelgid. They don't have any defenses. And because the adelgid came into this country, um, kind of snuck in, it doesn't have any natural enemies here. For the past 15 years, Carol has collected samples from across the state in an effort to track adelgid mortality. They really like more nutritious new growth, mm -hmm. so they don't do well and they don't usually survive on older growth. Gotcha, so you're kind so of always, always looking the at the tips. tips. Gotcha. Yep, you got it. You're, a, you're a hemlock woolly adelgid <laughs> scout now. <laughs> so why should we be concerned with the well-being of hemlock trees? It's called the redwood of the east. It is a very long-lived tree. A lot of the ecologists have determined that it's what they call a foundation species. It creates such a special ecosystem when it's a dominant tree, and so many insects and amphibians, and birds, and mammals rely on the shelter and protection of trees that it's a very significant ecological role. So if you lose the hemlocks, you lose that whole ecosystem. Since it was first reported in Virginia in the early 1950s, the adelgid has spread widely infesting much of the East Coast, and recently has gotten as far north as Nova Scotia. This northward spread has been aided, in part, by warmer winter temperatures due to climate change. Okay, tree number two. Cody, you can find the adelgid now. <laughs> so, believe it or not, there's a branch with adelgid on this tree. And this is a very healthy looking tree. All right, give me this. All right, go on. <laughs> Remember, I think look low. Start here, I guess. Oh, look at that. You found it. Yes, you did, didn't you? In a good infestation. You need a research assistant? I do. You found it. That was pretty good. You went right <laughs> up to it. That was a good hand you gave me. <laughs> Low line. Stick, stick yeah. pointing <laughs> up. But as you can see, most of this tree does not have it. Thank you so much. Carol and her fellow scientists are swiftly exploring ways to halt the adelgid. This is Sasaji Skimnasugi. It is the first biological control that was introduced in the U.S. Seeing that these lady beetles naturally feed on adelgid in Japan, they've been introduced to some parts of the U.S. to help mitigate the spread. In Japan, adelgid is not a problem. It exists on the trees, the trees are fine. It's actually very scarce in Japan. The whole premise of biological control is where did the pest come from? How is it regulated in its native homeland? And could we use some of those natural enemies after really careful screening to make sure they won't cause a problem when they're introduced here? How much do they cost, you know? Yeah, so they're about $2 a beetle. Can really? you believe that? Where's $2 my... for one of those things. <laughs> Alongside biological control, Carol believes an increasingly frequent weather phenomenon could abruptly drive down adelgid numbers. There's a generation of the adelgid actually survives and feeds throughout the winter which is totally unusual. Most insects go in hibernation, they go dormant, that's how they survive winters. But the adelgid, it's out there feeding, developing now. They're not dormant. And in the year 2000, it was really interesting. We had a cold outbreak. All the adelgids in the northern half of the state were killed, like stone cold killed. If winter can, a sudden winter like that could kill adelgids, I wonder what's the bigger role of that. So that told me that, okay, these cold outbreaks, they can really decimate the adelgid populations, and that's good for the trees. 
These cold snaps are associated with polar vortexes, and climate change has a notable influence on their occurrences. We won't go into the specifics, but if you want to learn about the mechanisms behind it, check out the links in the description. And that's gonna do the trick, I think, in suppressing adelgids, because year after year, if you're knocking them back 90%, it's as it's good as shooting in chemicals at them. I mean, it can't get any better. This is nature's way of taking care of the problem. So, so climate change is creating almost a range expansion of sorts. Yes. But then there's the other side of it where climate change, you know, weakening the jet stream, you're getting more frequent cold snaps with polar vortexes is simultaneously killing them. Is that essentially right. what's going on here? Yes, okay. you've you summarized it beautifully. Good. Climate change is exceedingly complex. It's regularly simplified to increasing temperatures and rising sea levels. But as this story has shown, there are many more dynamics working to constantly challenge our anticipations. So is your van going to make it all the way to Alaska? Only time will tell. We're going to try. That's a huge adventure. Yeah, the, plan, or it's, it's, the plan for that is like August maybe. Okay.